This is a video lecture on the peak of, Medi of papal power during the medieval church. As we've mentioned earlier, the Western church developed in a much different environment and under much different circumstances than the Eastern church. In, in the Eastern church, the, uh, the Byzantine power remained in, Byzantine empire remained in power. And so Christianity had some, had imperial protection and life was much um, safer for people. But in the West, after the fall of the Roman Empire, there were barbarian invasions of Western Europe, and there, there was no uh, real imperial power to protect the people. And so the church stepped into that power vacuum. And so in the, the, in the West, uh, the church stepped into this vacuum to help preserve law and order during a time of great chaos. And so as a result of this different, very different environment and very different circumstance, um, the power of the popes grew over time, reaching their zenith in the 11th and 12th centuries. And so today we are going to be looking at the period of history when the pope, the power of the pope was at their highest. Um, as one book um, describes it, the papacy at this time was power incarnate because the popes were, the pope was literally the most powerful man in the world at that time. So the first person I want us to look at is a man named Pope Gregory the Seventh. Um, he was born with the name Hildebrand in central Italy. He was unattractive and had a weak voice, but he was brilliant. He served faithfully in the church under five different popes. And before he became Pope, Hildebrand worked to ensure that popes were chosen by bishops rather than by kings. And this was actually a good thing because it meant this meant that the election of the pope was free from interference by different kings and interference by different nations and different governments. However, as we'll see, this did not bring an end to conflict between kings and popes. Hildebrand, Hildebrand was elected as pope in the year 1073, and he took the name Gregory VII. Pope Gregory VII was concerned about corruption in the church, and he identified and he identified three issues that he believed were behind the corruption in the church. The first of these was the sale of church offices. This is where um, people who were powerful and wealthy were able to basically buy church offices either for themselves or for their friends or family members. So this is simony. It's also known as simony, the sale of church offices. And it's also known as nepotism, where they granted favoritism, showed favoritism to their family members. Okay. So this was the first cause of corruption in the medieval church, the sale of church offices. The second thing that Gregory VII identified as a source of corruption in the church was the marriage of priests. Um, he felt that um, having, having a wife and a family was preventing priests from becoming being totally dedicated to serving God, just like in uh, Paul talks about 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, now, we in the Protestant tradition um, have a long history of pastors and other ministers having wives or husbands. And so we're, we're used to seeing marriage um, pastors or ministers being married. But in Pope Gregory's mind, the seventh mind, he believed that priests should be devoted to the church alone. And so he believed that priests having um, wives or even um, mistresses was causing a lot of corruption in the church. And then the third thing that Greg, Pope Gregory VII believed was causing corruption in the church was the appointment of church officials by powerful laymen. Uh, this is known as in lay investiture. And we'll look, we will talk at length about lay investiture in this lecture. So these were the three things that Pope Gregory VII believed was causing corruption in the church the sale of church offices, the marriage of priests, and the appointment of church, of church officials by powerful laymen. So what did Pope Gregory do to um, deal with this corruption that existed in the Catholic Church at that time? Well, as Pope, Gregory VII instituted a number of reforms. He purged the clergy of married priests. And so, you know, today, when you look at the Catholic Church, what you will find is the vast majority of church officials in the Catholic Church are celibate. They are unmarried men, or in the case of nuns, they are unmarried women, or and um or even unmarried deaconesses, okay? So this is why the Catholic Church does not allow its clergy, its priests, monks or nuns to be married. And it was in large part due to Pope Gregory VII's effort to purge the clergy of married priests. Pope Gregory VII also worked to ensure the ordination of devout and competent priests. And this was a good thing because, you know, if you, if you want to have um, devout and competent people leading your local church so that you want them to be devout, meaning you want them to have a deep love for Jesus so that they can be a good example to the people they're leading. You also want them to be competent, to have proper knowledge, and to um, not only have proper knowledge, but to have the skills necessary to be a good pastor. So this is a good thing. He, Pope Gregory VII worked to ensure the ordination of devout and competent priests. He also worked to abolish the sale of sacred things and offices. This is also good because um, he did not want, he, he recognized that the sale of sacred things and the sale of sacred offices could easily lead to corruption and was in fact leading to corruption. So this is a good thing that he did. He also went beyond the church and he attacked corruption among lawyers, administrators, and merchants. And this also was a good thing because, you know, you want, if you, if you go to a court for a court case or some legal proceeding, you want to know that the lawyer who represents you and the lawyer who represents other client, other people in the court are honest. You want to know that administrators who are over, who are watching over um, affairs in their in the city and in the nation, 
are also honest, are men and women of integrity. And you want merchants to be men and women of integrity because you want them to be able to give you fair prices and to not cheat you in business. He also worked to, Pope Gregory VII also worked to use the sacrament of penance as a means of converting hearts and minds. Um, many times, you know, we, we want to see people change, but how do we go about encouraging people to change? Well, Pope Gregory VII saw the penance, the sacrament of penance as a way to encourage people to change their hearts and their mind so that they would behave in ways that are more pleasing to God. So these are some things that Pope Gregory VII did to curb corruption and to try to root out corruption in the Catholic Church in his day. Now, in his effort to root out corruption, Gregory VII had, um, came into an epic conflict with King Henry IV of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, um, the issue behind this conflict between Pope Gregory VII and King Henry IV of the Holy Roman Empire was the issue of lay investiture. And the trigger for this controversy was the appointment of the Archbishop of Milan. Milan is a town, is a city in Northern Italy. And at that time it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. So the Cathedral of Milan uh, chose a man named Otto to be the Archbishop of Milan. But King Henry IV rejected Otto and appointed a man named Godfrey as the Archbishop of Milan. Still later, King Henry IV um, King Henry IV rejected both Otto and Godfrey and appointed Tidald who used to serve in Henry IV's royal chapel. Gregory VII rejected both of King Henry IV's appointment. Henry IV, in turn, summoned a synod of German bishops at Worms who rejected the Pope's authority and denounced Gregory VII as a false monk and deposed him from the papacy. So this, we see how this, uh, this conflict and this dispute between Gregory VII and King Henry IV quickly escalated to become a major power struggle in Western Europe, where the question was now, you know, who is, who is in charge? Who has the right to choose who church officials will be. And so Gregory VII responded to King Henry IV's defiance by excommunicating him. Now, excommunication is when a person is formally, officially um, kicked out of a religious group. And so in this case, Pope Gregory VII was saying to Henry IV, you are no longer considered a Catholic. And this was really a really serious punishment that Gregory VII imposed on Henry IV. Because um, what happened, okay, because this excommunication meant that all of King Henry IV's subjects and vassals were no longer responsible to keep their oaths of loyalty to King Henry IV. In fact, Christians across Europe were forbidden 
to obey King Henry IV. And so by excommunicating King Henry IV, Gregory VII was placing King Henry IV's throne at risk, at serious risk. So after, and after Pope Gregory VII excommunicated King Henry IV, the German princes responded to this excommunication by rebelling against King Henry IV and civil war broke out within the Holy Roman Empire. Now, faced with this threat to his rule, Henry IV knew he had to do something. So he traveled to Canossa, which is in Northern Italy in, Janu in January of 1077, uh, because that was where Pope Gregory VII was spending Christmas. Henry IV sought the Pope's forgiveness, but when um, Henry IV reached the gates to the castle where Gregory VII was staying, the men who were guarding the gate refused to let him enter because Pope Gregory VII had issued orders to refuse entry to King Henry IV. And so King Henry IV then took on the role of a penitent and he kneeled on the ground barefoot in ragged clothes while a winter blizzard raged around him. And he did this, he kept doing this for one day, two days, for three days. He did this. And finally, after three days of watching King Henry IV kneeling outside in rags in the middle of this terrible snowstorm, Pope Gregory VII finally relented. And he finally let King Henry IV enter the city, enter the castle, and he officially forgave. King Henry IV. And so um, this was a this was a humiliation. By doing this, Gregory VII humiliated King Henry IV. And the question was, who is in charge here? Well, at that moment, Gregory VII proved that he was more powerful than any king in Europe. Now, after Gregory VII removed Henry IV's excommunication, relationship between that, the relationship between them still wasn't very good because Gregory, even though he had forgiven um, Henry IV, and even though he had removed the excommunication, he still wasn't happy about King Henry IV. And so King Henry IV went back to um, his capital and he succeeded in um, reuniting the German princes. And when that happened, he was excommunicated again by Pope Gregory VII. Henry IV responded to this second excommunication by invading Italy. Um, Henry IV's army laid siege to Rome, and Henry IV installed a rival pope, Clement III. Gregory IV fled south to Salerno and appealed for help from the Norman rulers in Sicily. The Normans were the Normans eagerly accepted Pope Gregory VII's invitation for help. And um, they invaded Rome, burning, raping, and pillaging, pillaging the city of Rome. Unfortunately for Gregory VII, he was not restored to the papacy 
and he died in exile in Salerno in 1085, hated by the people of Rome. Although King, although Pope Gregory VII ultimately died in exile, Henry IV's penance at Canossa was an important moment in church history because Gregory VII defended the right of the church to order it its own internal life. The outcome of this conflict also meant that the government would not have total control over all of society. There were some areas of society that the government could not control, such as the spiritual lives of individuals and houses of worship. The investiture controversy was finally resolved in 1122 with the Concordat of Worms. Now, a concordat is a special term and it refers to an agreement that is made between the Catholic Church and a civil government or a secular government. So that's what a concordat is. And the Concordat of Worms um, was an agreement between the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope. And in this agreement, the Holy Roman Emperor gave up the right to appoint church officials, except in the event of a dispute. The election of bishops and abbots were to be held in the presence of the Holy Roman Emperor. And upon election, uh, the new bishops and abbots were then given different, different symbols of authority, okay? They were given a ring and a staff, which symbolized their spiritual power. At the same time, they were given a scepter, which symbolized their earthly power. And this scepter was handed over to them by the king or by the king's representative. And the reason why these bishops and abbots held symbols of both power was because not only did they have great spiritual power, but they were also um, oftentimes um, major landlords. And that when they stepped into that office, when they, when they took up this office, they would be responsible not only for maybe um, uh, a monastery or a church, but they would also be responsible for the lands that belong to that monastery or that church or even for an entire district. So this is why they were handed symbols for both spiritual authority and um, earthly authority. So that is um, the papacy of Pope Gregory VII. Now let's look at Pope Innocent III. Pope Innocent III was born under the name Lothar of Segni. He was born into an, an aristocratic Roman family. Now this man was literally born to power and he received the best education money could buy at, in his day. He studied theology at the University of Paris, and he studied law at the University of Bologna. Um, he is, as far as we know, the first pope to have a university education. He was elected pope in 1198 at the age of 37, and this was a very young age to be a pope. And so he brought a lot of energy and youth to the job. And he proved to be a very energetic pope. Um, he believed very strongly in the Catholic teaching that the pope is the vicar of Christ. That is, he believed that he was Christ's representative on earth. And vicar 
is a Latin phrase that means representative or in the place of. So he believed that he was the representative of Christ on earth and that he was standing in the place of Christ on earth. And therefore that he believed that gave him the right not only to rule over the church, but also the right to rule over the entire world because the whole world belongs to Jesus. And therefore as Christ regent or vicar on earth, that meant that he believed that he had the right, just as Jesus did, to rule over the entire world. Now, at the time that Innocent III was elected Pope, the papacy was the most powerful position in Europe. And Pope Innocent III was deeply involved in political matters throughout Europe and beyond. So let's let me show you some of the different nations and different political issues he was involved in. Um, he was involved in a dispute with Philip II of France, King Philip II. Now, King Philip II was a widower. His first wife had died in, during childbirth. And so Philip II then married Princess Ingborg from Denmark. And he agreed to marry her without ever seeing her. He, was, he received reports that she was very beautiful and fair and so forth. But on their wedding night, he refused to, he refused to sleep with her. We don't know why. There are several different theories about why King Philip II refused Princess Ingborg on their wedding night, um, but it's all speculation. We don't really know why, but the fact remains he did refuse her on their wedding night. And so after that, Ingborg found herself all, all basically all alone, except for the few Danes who traveled with her to France. She was a stranger, a foreigner in a strange land. Her husband had just rejected her and her husband was the king. He had all the power in the kingdom. And so poor Ingborg fled to a monastery. And that's where she stayed um, to keep safe. And then um, she appealed to Pope Clement III for help to convince Philip II that she was his lawful wife. Because what Philip II did immediately after that wedding night was he started trying to get the marriage annulled. And he claimed that their marriage was never consummated. He claimed that they had never slept together and therefore that their marriage was never consummated and that on those grounds, the marriage should be con considered null. That is to be considered as if it had never actually taken place. Now, um, later, Clement III died, and then um, Pope Innocent III became the new Pope. And, um, but three years after Philip II married Ingborg, he married another princess, Agnes of Merania. Now, Philip II did not send Agnes away. In fact, he and Agnes had two children. Yeah. So here he was. He was trying to argue that his second wife was not his real wife, and he had married his third wife and had two children with her. Now, Pope Innocent III declared 
Philip II's marriage to Agnes null and void, meaning he declared King Philip II's marriage, third marriage, to be illegal, unlawful. And he ordered Philip II to return to Ingborg. When Philip II refused to return to Ingborg, Innocent III placed all of France under interdict. Now, interdict is a term that means, um, well, it, what happens during interdict is all church services inside a country that is placed under interdict are forbidden. So there were no masses, there were no church services taking place anywhere in France. And this also meant that French Catholics could no longer receive any of the sacraments. They could not get married, they could not get buried, they could not um, confess their sins, they could not have the, have the Lord take the Lord's Supper, um, and so this was considered a spiritual disaster for all the Catholics in France. And this placed enormous pressure on King Philip II. And so this, by, by not being able to take any of the sacraments, French Catholics believed that they had been deprived the means of grace, because in Catholic theology, God's grace works in people's lives through the sacraments. They believe that's how God works his grace in our lives, is through the sacraments. And so by refusing to allow any sacraments to, um, in France, this meant that the people of France were not able to receive God's grace as long as France was under interdict. So, this placed enormous pressure on King Philip II, and he eventually took Ingborg as his wife again, and he sent Agnes away. And so, Agnes died a couple of years later in 1201 of a broken heart. And you can imagine why she died of a broken heart. So that was Innocent III's uh, conflict with King Philip II. But that was not the only king whom um, Innocent III clashed with. He also clashed with King John of England. Now, King John of England was so bad, there was only one King John in British history. There has never been a King John II. That's how bad of a king he was. Now, um, the source of controversy between King John and Pope Innocent III was centered around this man, Stephen Langton. Stephen Langton um, was Innocent III's friend from his college days. And um, Innocent III wanted to appoint Stephen Langton as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, you know, you might say, well, this is a case of favoritism. I think it was more than favoritism because Stephen Langton was a brilliant man. Um, he had written, he was, a, he was an accomplished biblical scholar, and he had even written essays arguing that God's original intention was not for nations to be ruled by kings. So you can see why King John might not want to have Stephen Langton be the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
So King John refused to accept Innocent III's appointment of Stephen Langton. And so in response to King John's refusal, Innocent III placed England under interdict. So when this happened, King John now faced the prospect of rebellion within England and an invasion from France. And so when, when he faced the threat of rebellion within his own kingdom and the rebellion, the, the threat of an invasion from France, King John decided to submit to Innocent III and he agreed to appoint Stephen Langton as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, King John even made England a fiefdom of the Pope as the Pope's vassal, and he paid the Pope a, a rent, an annual rental of 1,000 marks per year. Now, Stephen Langton's appointment as the Archbishop of Canterbury proved to be important in history because two years after his appointment, um, he joined together with other English princes to force King John to sign the Magna Carta. And now we don't know who wrote the Magna Carta. There is some speculation that Stephen Langton may have had a hand in writing the Magna Carta, but we don't know. That is speculation. What we do know is that he was very much, he was very favorable to many of the provisions that were included in the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta in turn helped lay the foundation for constitutional democracy in England, the United States, and other English-speaking countries around the world. So Stephen Langton's appointment as the Archbishop of Canterbury was a pretty important appointment in history. And because the Magna Carta set the principle that no one is above the law, not even the king. Another, and this is a picture of King John signing the Magna Carta in the year 1215 at Runnymede in England. Another king whom Pope Innocent III clashed with was King Otto IV of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, when King Henry VI who was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, died suddenly at age 32 on September 28, 1197. The Holy Roman Empire was thrown into turmoil as the princes of the Holy Roman Empire debated the future direction of the empire. And the problem was that King Henry VI's son, Frederick, was only three years old. Three years old is too young to rule a kingdom, okay? And so the question is, who is going to be our king? We can't let this toddler rule the kingdom. So who will be our king? Some princes elected Henry's brother, Philip, as king of the Holy Roman Empire in March of 1198, while other princes elected Henry's nephew, Otto, as Holy Roman Emperor in June of 1198. In 1201, Innocent III um, decided this case in favor of Otto. So Otto became Otto IV of the Holy Roman Empire. However, Otto IV did not have undisputed power until Philip, the other contender, was murdered. 
Unfortunately, politics in Europe at that time was pretty rough. Once he had undisputed power, Otto IV broke his promises to Pope Innocent III, and Innocent III responded by withdrawing his support for Otto IV and giving his support to Frederick. Otto IV then allied, became allied with King John of England, and they fought the French in a battle. And they lost the Battle of Bovines, Bovines in July of 1214. Okay, so King Henry, I mean, King Otto IV and King um, John both joined forces together. They fought against the French army in 1214 and they lost. And as a result of losing this battle, Otto IV lost his throne and King John agreed to Innocent III's appointment of Stephen Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury. And he made England a fiefdom of the Pope because after this battle, after he lost this battle to France, King John knew that England could be next and that England was in danger of being invaded by France. Innocent III also in, intervened strongly in the politics of Norway, Sweden, Bohemia, and Hungary. So he was involved in, the, in almost every nation in Europe. That is how powerful King Pope Innocent III was. Okay. Now, Innocent III was also a crusading pope, and he wanted to fight heretics and other enemies of Christianity. He called for the Fourth Crusade, which led to the sacking of Constantinople in 1204. And in the lecture on the crusade, I talked about how terrible this sack, this sack was and the consequences of this sacking. Um, now, Innocent III condemned the sacking of Constantinople, but later he saw the advantage of Latin occupation and control of Constantinople. And before his death in 1216, Pope Innocent III called for the Fifth Crusade, which actually took place after his death. Innocent III also launched the Albigensian Crusade, the first crusade against the heretics. And uh, we, we talked, I talked a little bit about the Albigensian Crusade in the lecture on the early reform movements in the medieval church. So if you want to uh, review that information, go back to that lecture. Um, Innocent the fourth, Innocent the third, Innocent the third also called the Fourth Lateran Council. This was a church council that met in Rome in November of 1215. This church council is considered one of the most important church councils in the Middle Ages. And the purpose of this church council was to reform the Catholic Church and regain the Holy Land. So the Fourth Lateran Council issued 70 decrees or canons. So here, a canon is not a weapon. It's not a gun that goes boom but it is a decree or rule or law, okay? And two of the most important canons that were um, produced at the Fourth Lateran Council were Canons 1 and Canon 21. Canon 1 affirmed transubstantiation. That is, this canon 
stated as official Catholic teaching, the teaching that during mass, the bread and the wine that are served during communion or the Lord's Supper become the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. And that it occurred, this occurs during mass, okay? Now, Canon 21 uh, said that all Christians are required to confess at least once a year and to attend mass at least once a year. Um, if you'll remember, um, Raymond talked about the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. And two of these sacraments included the sacrament of penance, which is confessing your sins to a priest. And then the priest will um, give you some kind of act of penance in order so that you can show that, you know, your heart has changed. Um, and it is an act of, of sorrow for your sin. Um, and then another um, sacrament that is included in the Catholic system of sacraments is um, Holy is Eucharist or Holy Communion, which can be taken only at Mass. And so that's why Canon 21 was issued. Now, this means that according to Catholic teaching, attending Mass is necessary for salvation. And this is because Mass and transubstantiation go together. Because if, tr if transubstantiation is true, then you must attend Mass, since it is only during Mass that transubstantiation occurs when the bread and wine become the actual body and blood of Christ. So the Catholic and Catholic teaching is that it is necessary to take the body and blood of Christ during Eucharist in order to be saved. So that's why we can say that according to Catholic teaching, attending mass is necessary for salvation. Okay. Now, after the papacy, I mean, after Pope Innocent III, the papacy began to decline. And there were some reasons for this. Um, one reason was that there were few able men. And a second reason was that there were, the Pope had few allies apart other than France. France was almost the only ally that the Pope had. So there were few able men to be Pope, to, to be good Popes, and the Pope had few allies other than France. Now, one of these later Popes is Pope Boniface VIII. Uh, he was also very involved in European politics, just as Pope Innocent III was. And as a result, Boniface VIII was involved in bitter dispute with several European kings. One of these was with King Philip IV of France. King Philip IV wanted to tax the church in France. Now, King England at the same time wanted to tax, also wanted to tax the church in England. And one of the reasons why this was going on was because kings in Europe were becoming more and more powerful. They were growing in power and they wished to have more money to accomplish their plan. Now, the other thing, the other, another reason for this is that King Philip IV and King Henry I were both fighting a war against each other at this time. So this is why they both separately wanted to tax their own, the churches in their own countries, in France and in England. Now, um, Boniface VIII was opposed to this move 
because he felt it went against the ancient rights of the church. And so he issued a papal bull for forbidding the taxing of clergy or churches and threatened to excommunicate anyone who did. Now, here the word bull does not refer to an animal. Instead, <laughs> a bull refers to a decree that is issued by the Pope. So the Pope issued a bull forbidding anyone to tax the church or any clergyman. Now, Philip IV retaliated against this bull by prohibiting the transfer of any money from France to Rome, including gold, silver, or any other precious metals. Now, the church depended on this money from France, so Boniface VIII eventually backed down. So he failed to prevent the churches in France and England from being taxed. But Boniface VIII and King Philip IV continued to have conflict with each other when Philip IV arrested a papal legate on charges of trying to start a rebellion in France. Now, a legate is a word that means ambassador. And so a papal legate was a papal ambassador. Um, the Pope appoints ambassadors to go to different countries around the world. And so these ambassadors are known as legates. And that's why a, an embassy of the Catholic Church is known as a legation because it is the residence of the legate. Okay, so Boniface VIII, after Philip IV arrested this ambassador, this legate on charges of trying to start a rebellion in France, Boniface VIII wrote another papal bull, this one protesting the arrest and the trial of the legate. Philip II, in turn, responded by having the papal bull officially burned in public. So this would be the equivalent of burning another nation's flag. And so this was um, an act of disrespect. He just had, he burned the papal bull in public before a large crowd. Boniface VIII then sent another legate to France to reassert his control over the French clergy. And Philip IV in turn responded by convening the first ever Estates General in Paris. Uh, the Estate General is the French parliament. Okay, so that is the French legislative body. And so this was the very first time that the French estate general was convened in Paris. The members of the estate general wrote a letter to the Pope defending the French king and his earthly power. Boniface VIII then wrote a third papal bull this one declaring that both earthly and spiritual power are under the Pope's jurisdiction and that kings are subject to the Pope. The conflict between Boniface VIII and Philip IV continued to escalate. And in September 1303, the French army attacked Boniface VIII in his palace. Boniface was beaten badly. I mean, physically beaten badly. And he died a month later. And that was the end of Boniface's papacy. Then we come to Pope Clement V. Pope Clement V was a weak man and he did have a reputation for greed, yet 
He was not completely without principles. For example, he refused to condemn Boniface VIII because after Boniface VIII's death, King Henry IV, um, King Philip IV of France convened a trial to, to judge uh, Boniface VIII posthumously. And Pope Clement V refused to condemn Boniface VIII. He also was reluctant to dissolve the Knights Templar in 1312. Uh, you may remember that in the um, lecture about reform movements, I talked about how the Knights Templar were persecuted viciously by Philip IV. And they were, um, many of them were arrested, tortured, and forced to confess to crimes. And most of these crimes that they confessed to probably never happened. Yet many of them were killed, burned, or hanged um, because of these false confessions. And it was Philip IV who forced Pope Clement V to dissolve the Knights Templar. And so it was with great reluctance that Pope Clement did that. And under great pressure from Philip IV, Clement V moved the papacy to Avignon in France in 1309. The papal court remained in Avignon until 1377. And while they were, while the popes were in Avignon, they were largely puppets of the French kings. And since this day in France lasted nearly 70 years, it became known as the Babylonian captivity. And so this was a period when the papacy was in decline. So now let's look at a couple of reflection questions. And I want to encourage you to think about these questions and to post your answers to one of these questions in our discussion forum online. So the first question I want to encourage you to think about is how can we guard ourselves against corruption, especially as ministers? Um, we saw in this lecture and in earlier lectures how the church during the Middle Ages became very corrupt. And the sad reality is all of us are tempted to become corrupt. So the question is, how can we guard ourselves against corruption? And the second question I want to encourage you to think about is, what lessons can you learn from the history of the papacy in the Middle Ages? Um, we, we find a lot of crazy things happening with the papacy. Um, so what can we learn from all of this? Because one of the things about studying history is the great challenge is for us to look at history and to see if we can draw lessons from the path that can help us today. So think about these questions and respond to them. Okay, I look forward to seeing you in class and God bless.